from a beam of sunlight, a kaleidoscope of colours, the first step towards a new form of imagery. For a long time, scientists have known that these effects can be produced by a pattern in a piece of glass. A grid of microscopic lines will bend the beam and separate out its colours. What's much newer is the discovery that a similar pattern, differently lit, produces not colours, but shapes. Nick Phillips explains. Well, that probably surprised you. A three-dimensional picture recorded on a flat piece of photographic material. Is there anything behind this sheet of glass here? Let's turn it round and have a look. No. It is in fact an image produced by a hologram. Very real and quite startling. This is a hologram. Behind the plate, the unicorn looks like a statue, but incredibly, there's nothing there. And it's this world of utterly real and yet completely illusory images that we'll be exploring in the programme today, the world of holography. One of its leading exponents is the physicist Nick Phillips. His interest in the subject developed out of a fascination with the weird and beautiful light of the laser, a preoccupation with the unusual, which was to shape both his future and that of holography. Lasers are not only beautiful, they are very precise. And they are essential for making holograms because of the strange way in which they add together under laboratory conditions. Spread out a single laser beam and you produce a bright light on a screen. But add to it a second beam and a pattern of light and dark appears, like the one that separated the colours in sunlight. It's a similar pattern which conjures up the holographic image and which is set down when the hologram is recorded. Now we're making a hologram. In front of me, I have an object, a complicated looking object, but chosen to accentuate three-dimensionality, which is being lit by laser light. I can demonstrate that. If you look at these pencil beams which are coming along the bench here, I can cut the light off and the image, the object here goes black, then the light bouncing off the object lands on the photographic plate from here and light coming from a mirror down at the far end of the bench comes straight on to the photographic material here. The mixing of the light bouncing off the object and the light coming direct to the photographic plate produces patterns of light and dark, which after processing gives rise to the formation of a holographic image. Take away the object and you're left with an optical illusion. An image so real that its shadows and its perspective change as the camera pans across it. And an illusory magnifying glass produces a real, or perhaps it's an illusory magnification. Holograms are three-dimensional images, but they're far more than just photographs with an extra dimension. Because no lens is used during the recording, there's no plane of focus and every part of the image is equally sharp. It's only our camera which needs to refocus. What's more, holograms are so detailed that what you can see on the real circuit board, you can see on the hologram their resolution is unparalleled. Floating pictures with an undeniable fascination. Big business has been quick to spot their potential for advertising. A three-dimensional image recorded on a two-dimensional glass plate, a plate with many strange properties. Two images can be stored on it. Just change the angle to replay them. 
while on another plate, a second beam conjures up a second image. And if you paint out a section, you don't lose Mickey Mouse entirely. You just have to move the camera to see him. Every part of the plate contains a record of the entire scene from its own angle, a point which can be demonstrated more dramatically. On every fragment of glass, enough information to replay all three figures. So can scientists use this phenomenal capacity to store information to make sense of the world about them? Here, thousands of recordings of earth tremors have been stacked holographically. And sure enough, it's given geologists a new perspective on the layering in the Earth's crust. Another application depends on the relation between the object, here a metal funnel, and its holographic image. When the two are superimposed, there's just a faint shadow. But squeeze the object and the imperceptible change of shape causes the funnel to clash with its hologram. Patterns appear. For the technologist, those patterns are the most sensitive measure of deformation and movement yet devised. So far, all the holograms we've seen have depicted inanimate objects, rigid objects, set pieces. To make such pictures, we require a very stable and rigid bench. This one has a concrete top weighing between 15 and 20 tons. Exposures of the hologram may take several seconds, and if any of the apparatus moves by a tiny fraction of the wavelength of light, then the image disappears totally. So to take pictures of moving or animate objects, a totally different type of laser would be used. A pulsed ruby laser producing a very brief flash of red light. Three, two, one, no. Thank you, Chris. I think we got about 9.8 joules there. The Central Electricity Board's John Webster is experimenting with holograms of himself. He thinks that large volume holograms could open up a range of new applications. A room like this has objects in the foreground. But if, for instance, the scene is recorded on a photograph, the midfield is clear, but the foreground is not. If from this photograph you now wanted to inspect those clamps at the front, you wouldn't be able to. They're just an out-of-focus blur. But in a hologram, everything is recorded. Here, even the tip of the clamp is sharp. So could holography have a role to play in examining structures which can't be approached directly? Fuel elements such as these, when they're discharged from nuclear reactors, are radioactively very hot and we're interested in developing techniques to record the condition, to build up a history of the entire reactor, of these elements. Photographs such as these at the moment are taken. As you see, they're barely sharp. It's mainly because they're taken from a great distance through a protection window with a conventional camera. The hologram offers us the opportunity of not only recording the condition of the end caps, but the entire length of the fuel element. The fuel element's the driving force of the nuclear power station, the bit which contains the uranium. It's vital to know its condition, yet in operation it's completely inaccessible. The hologram can be considered as a window behind which the object is really present, with all its dimensions, with all its information. Down the length of the metre-long fuel can, the camera picks out the various grids which support the pipes of uranium. And back again to the end caps. You can do just the same with its hologram. The image may be less substantial, but it's no less detailed. In other words, there's theoretically no need to have the object in front of you to make an inspection. All you need is its hologram. 
There, in the special holographic emulsion, is recorded information down to a millionth of an inch. Details of structures so small that we can't see them because they're beyond the reach of our most powerful microscope. And the hologram has another trick up its sleeve. Now, at the moment, we're viewing the virtual image which lies behind the holographic plate. However, if we turn the plate round, simply back to front, we now project the image, a real image, in front of the plate. And to prove that, take a ground glass screen, put it in the plane of the projected image, and we clearly see the ends of the can. And if we come forward, we can see the grid that holds the rods, and back to the cap ends. Indeed, it might be said that it's rather better than having the actual object to examine. Continue along the length, the, the length of the rods, halfway. What he's doing is looking at cross sections along the length of the fuel can, and you certainly couldn't do that with the real object. We now see the end. The future of large volume holography depends on the development of a holographic camera, but its potential is obviously enormous. So, too, following its own very different course is that of conventional holography. As Nick Phillips explains, a very important step forward has just been taken. The difference between these holograms and the one that you've seen previously is that these are white light holograms. They're lit by the sort of lamp that's inside the average slide projector, thus allowing the hologram to be unchained from the laboratory. It's something one could take outdoors, even, and look at in clear sunlight. Progress in this field is now rapid, and it's a very exciting visual medium for the future. Holography today is in the position that photography was in a hundred years ago. Its future scope is so vast that it's difficult to contemplate. Holographic movies and full-color holograms are already on the way. The advertisers are about to surround us with holographic images. Soon, we'll all have holograms hanging on our walls. The age of holograms is upon us. If you'd like more information about today's programme, write to Living Tomorrow, P.O. Box 48, London, SE1, England.